Greetings friends and welcome to the old world. I'm Lorcan and this is only war. In this, the fourth episode in the history of the Old World, we'll cover the fates of the Elves and the Dwarves in the aftermath of the War of the Beard, and the blood-soaked birth of three corrupted empires. The Skaven race arises in Skaven Blight, Neferata's vampire court takes hold in Nehekara, and the exiled Nagash rebuilds his strength. Before we begin, a huge thanks to the supporters on Patreon who are helping build the channel towards the goal of more regular uploads in the future. The Patreon and other ways you can support Only War, either directly or through using my affiliate links, are in the description. If you're new here, thank you for joining us, and I hope I earn your subscription today. The Dwarves had won the War of the Beard with the slaying of Phoenix King Calidor II at Tor Alessi. High King Gotrek would retreat to Karazakarak, taking the Phoenix Crown with him, while Prince Caladriel would be elected as the next Phoenix King by the Council of Princes, when Prince Thoriel relinquished the bloodline of Kalador's claim to the throne. However, before we look at what fate would have in store for the two elder races in the centuries to come, we will return to Nehekara and the aftermath of Nagash's Reign of Terror. The army of the Seven Kings had defeated Nagash and his immortals in 1740 before the coming of Sigmar. The intervention of the Lamian army and their black powder weapons, under the command of priest king Lamashazar, had swung the final stages of that war against the great necromancer. In the aftermath, Lamashazar struck a deal with Arkan the Black to retrieve the books of Nagash, as contained in those tomes was the secret of the elixir of life. Arkan had, of course, attempted to betray the Lamian king once inside the Black Pyramid, and had received a pistol bullet in the heart that, while lodged there, prevented him from healing. Lama Shazar would pay to have the rumour spread that Arkan had remained loyal to Nagash, and fought to the bitter end, while in secret, he carried the former Grand Vizier back to his kingdom, where his queen, Neferata, had begun ruling in his stead. Nagash himself had been badly wounded by the dragon staves of the Lamians, and forced to retreat back to his Black Pyramid to attempt to recuperate. Whether he had anticipated the swift actions of the Seven Kings in marching on Khemri and breaching his inner sanctum is unknown, but he was forced to flee again, and this time he found himself in the wasteland at the foothills of the Brittle Peaks, wounded and weak. Haunted by the ghosts of his past, Nagash would receive a vision of a dark mountain beyond his mortal sight that called him forward. He was attacked by a desperate Skaven foraging party, and from their blood he tasted the taint of Warpstone for the first time. In their possessions he found small pieces of the glowing green rock, and observing the teeth marks upon them, he consumed a fragment. The Warpstone infused Nagash's weakened frame with a wild, unnatural power, and while nothing in comparison to the awesome energies he had wielded in the past, it allowed him to heal his wounds and press on in search of the Dark Mountain. In Nehekara, there were few celebrations after the victory over Nagash's forces at Merak. For ninety years, the Priest Kings hunted down the immortals that had escaped, finally slaying the last after a lengthy siege at Kar Shabar. The once blessed land was in ruin, and the Priest Kings were left to haggle over the scraps, and argue over how the kingdom would be reshaped now victory was achieved. Unbeknownst to the other rulers, Lamashazar and his cabal had been hard at work deciphering Nagash's stolen tomes, and had managed to create a weak version of his elixir of life. It had allowed him and Neferata to hold back the ravages of time, slowing the aging process considerably, but no more. In the decades that passed, Nagash wandered the wasteland, determining the nature of the warp stone and learning how to use it for his sorcerous arts. But his belief that it would lead him to the Black Mountain proved incorrect. He concluded that although the mountain must contain large quantities of the fell substance for him to have detected its power radiating over such vast distances, 
Its chaotic nature meant using it for magical divination was nearly impossible. Finally, a hazy glow from the northeast drew his attention, a faint greenish luminescence that lined the mountain tops of the brittle peaks. Nagash found himself staring down at a broad dark sea, and to the east the dark slopes of the mountain, far more imposing than those that surrounded it, which had called to him for a century. Nagash named the body of water the Sour Sea, and along its banks he found barbarian settlements, the occupants showing many signs of mutation from the warpstone taint in the area. In these primitive people he saw the slaves and soldiers he would need to build a new empire to rule. The settlements became larger and more elaborate as Nagash drew closer to the Great Mountain, until he eventually came across a fortification unlike any he had seen in the area. He also noted the barbarian priests that held sway there, and appeared free from the mutating effects of the warp stone that they wore as part of their priestly vestments. The structure was both temple and fortress, restricting the various tribes' access to the mountain beyond. Nagash secreted himself amongst a funeral procession leading from the fortification to the barrows at the foot of the mountain. Here he observed the priests animating the corpses of the dead and commanding them to enter their own barrows. Nagash now knew that these tribal priests not only drew on the power of the warp stone for necromantic rituals, but that he also had access to an army of the dead once his power grew once more. Nagash explored the great mountain that would become known as Cripple Peak in years to come. Two-thirds up the ascent he found a fissure that led to a low-ceilinged cave that would become his new sanctum. From there, Nagash discovered a tangled network of tunnels and passageways that ran through the fractured mountain. Although extensive, the great necromancer did not discover the warpstone deposits he'd craved, and he knew it would take an army of slaves to sink shafts to plunder its depths, so he turned his attentions back to the surface once more. Entering the barrows of the barbarian tribes, Nagash animated the corpse of a het man, a tribal leader, but he found the priests were not as careless as he had assumed, and the newly risen corpse, and also its retainers, attacked him, causing grisly wounds before Nagash could fight them off. Outside the barrow, he found half a dozen priests who had been controlling the reanimated corpses, and Nagash blasted them with arcs of green fire and set about those who survived with his dagger. The exertion was nearly too much for his weakened frame, and he realized he would need more power to enact his plans. The priests, known as the Keepers of the Mountain, sent hunting parties scouring the mountains for the necromancer, after his presence had been discovered at the barrows, but he was able to hide deep in the labyrinth of tunnels where the concentration of glowing warpstone vapours would overcome any mortal pursuers. Nagash continued to consume the warpstone dust he could retrieve from the mountain to supplement his power, and its effects now left him a grotesque skeletal figure. Dark muscles held together more by sorcery than sinew were visible beneath his tattered skin, and his eyes long since rotted away to be replaced by green bale fire in the empty sockets. The great necromancer discovered an ancient barrow in the area less patrolled by the priests and their acolytes, and in there he found not only corpses he could raise to serve him, but to guide him to the structure he had seen in the ancient murals painted on the walls. A temple of sorts, and at its heart a green glowing eye depicted deep in the mountain. His newly risen undead minions would lead Nagash to the site of the temple, and dig through the eroded earth until the entrance was revealed, and finally Nagash would have a source of warpstone sufficient for his needs, the glowing green eye having been carved from a lump of the fell substance as large as a wagon wheel. Infused with its potent energy, Nagash enacted a powerful ritual during a savage and near-unnatural storm that drew the attention of the patrolling priests. But they were no match for Nagash and his undead minions, and soon their reanimated corpses would swell his forces further. 
Nagash continued his ritual, power flowing in a torrent from his body to sink into hundreds of barrow mounds, and their occupants began clawing to the surface to obey his command. Soon he had a horde of skeletons over a thousand strong that grew in size as he marched them north towards the temple city of the Keepers of the Mountain. The priests sounded ancient alarm horns to signal for aid from the neighbouring barbarian settlements, but the storm prevented them from answering the call, and no relief came. The keepers of the mountain were no cowards, and stood their ground to defend their fortress, but the enemy they faced was implacable, and every brother who fell rose up and joined their enemy's ranks. The southern gate held the longest, but when Nagash himself entered the fray, the defenders stood little chance. Eventually, Nagash overcame the last of their resistance, when he confronted and killed the High Keeper. For a year, Nagash consolidated his strength around the mountain, raising a great tower from which he could oversee the mine workings and fortifications. Nagash learned that some amongst the barbarian tribes now worshipped him as a god, his coming a fulfilment of an ancient prophecy. The great necromancer also learned the barbarian hetman were close to uniting against raiders from the north, but without the aid of the keepers, they were losing badly. By 1597 before Sigmar, Nagash would lead the southern tribes against the invaders they called the Forsaken. The powerful Northmen were taken by surprise by the overwhelming numbers of undead and barbarian tribesmen, and their witches could not withstand the sorcerous power of the great necromancer. But despite this, the battle was closer than Nagash had anticipated. Eventually though, the Forsaken warriors broke, and the few remaining witches used an incantation to enfold them and their warlord in shadows before vanishing. Nagash had promised the barbarian hetman that they would be rewarded for their loyalty to him, and with cruel pleasure he instructed them that if they desired the Forsaken's power to be theirs, they must consume the bodies down to the bones. The first commandment of their new god. In the year 1599 before the coming of Sigmar, in Lamia, Queen Neferata had begun to plot against her brother priest king Lamashazar. Through a combination of the weak elixir and black lotus, the king had kept Arkham the Black a stupefied prisoner, but Neferata had started countering the effects of the lotus using Hyksa wasp venom. Lamashazar and his cabal that included the aged former priest Wurshoran and the king's champion Aberash were unaware of his prisoner's increasing consciousness. The priest king now cared little for the fortunes of his kingdom, obsessed as he was with mastering Nagash's incantations. In secret, Neferata and Arkan conducted their own rituals. Arkan revealed more secrets to her than he did to the king and his cabal, and the elixir they made from the blood of her handmaidens was much more potent. Eventually in 1595 before Sigmar, Neferata would bring one of her servants for Arkan to sacrifice, and the elixir they created from her lifeblood would be the most potent they had made. When Lamashazar and his cabal arrived to conduct their own ritual, Neferata revealed the progress she and Arkan had made in secret, and the strength her version of the elixir had granted her. With one demonstration of her power, she gained the allegiance of Lamashazar's cabal, and forced him to share rulership of the kingdom with her. She also demanded that Arkan be set free. With Neferata now in a position to obtain more living human subjects for their experiments, she and Arkan made more rapid progress, enhancing their version of the elixir, but still their mastery of its creation was far from complete. Priest King Lamashazar was reduced to a mere figurehead, although Neferata was careful not to expose the shift in power. For his part, Arkan was generally content with his relative freedom in Lamia, although he realised he was still tied to the fate of Neferata's silent coup. He busied himself assessing the strength of the local bandit warbands in case he needed to raise an army, but an attempt on his life by members of the Priest King's Cabal meant he would delay any thoughts of breaking free from the service of the Queen of Lamia. The assassination attempt on Neferata was more subtle in nature, a supernatural poison slipped into the golden goblet she would use to imbibe her latest elixir. Arkan would return in time to discover the newest elixir had been potent enough to prevent the queen's immediate death, 
and he carried her unconscious body away to the woman's palace. For six days, Arkan searched Nagash's tomes for a way to purge the poison. He had slowed its progress, but Neferata was now pale as alabaster and deathly cold to the touch. Only his enhanced senses could detect the slightest traces of life still within her. Every ritual he tried seemed to worsen her condition, as the Sphinx's venom seemed to have bound itself to the elixir in her bloodstream. On the seventh day, Arkan finally thought he'd found the answer. At the end of his latest ritual, the Queen's throat was cut open so her tainted blood would flow from her body. Then Arkan opened his own wrist and bade Neferata to drink his blood as he pressed the wound against her lips. The Queen began to gain strength, drinking hungrily as the wound in her neck closed up with startling speed. But then a change came upon her as her body began convulsing violently. Her flesh shriveled, stretching her skin taut against her bones. Her black hair became faded and brittle, and her eyes and cheeks sunk until her face was transformed into a bestial, ghoulish parody of its former beauty. With a scream, the Queen of Lamia seemed to finally slip into the embrace of death. Arkan felt some measure of grief for the passing of the Queen, and he decided to seek out Lamashazar before making his escape from the city. His plan was to assassinate the King, and while the city was in chaos following the death of both monarchs, Arkan would unite the bandit warbands that lived on the plains, before returning at the head of an army to take Lamia for his own. Arkan would find the Priest King in his royal bedchamber and take his revenge. In the same manner Lamashazar had incapacitated him, Arkan took the King's Dragon Stave pistol and shot him through the heart. The bullet lodged there, preventing the elixir from healing the King and leaving him trapped in his own mortally wounded body. Once the deed was done, Arkan began to make his escape, but before he could get far, he was cornered by Aberash and the palace guard, and after a short but bloody fight, the king's champion decapitated the immortal. In the aftermath, the king's privy council ordered the palace sealed off, and the mortuary cult priests began preparing Lamashazar's body for the afterlife. The protocols for the queen were different, and her body was tended to by her handmaidens before being given over to the priests. However, when the Grand Vizier Ubaid attended to the Queen just before dusk, Neferata would rise from her deathbed, stirring in her burial wrappings with a wet, rippling crackle before descending on her loyal handmaidens in a swift and violent orgy of bloodletting. Crushing skulls and tearing out throats with prominent leonine fangs as she feasted hungrily upon them. Transfixing Hubaid with her eyes that were now twin points of cold, pitiless light shining with bestial hunger, she ordered him to fall to his knees and demanded to know what had transpired. When the queen emerged from the woman's palace, she was pale and terrible in her glory, her restored beauty now supernatural and dark, depthless eyes that banished rational thought and replaced it with a deep, all-consuming yearning to serve. It was not only her own subjects that found themselves under Neferata's beguilement. While in 1597 the priest kings of the other cities arrived in Lamia to bear witness to the passing of the king, they found themselves equally entranced as they formalized the city's ascension as the center of wealth and power in all Nehekara. Reborn in the crucible of poison, sorcery, and death, Neferata realized she was nothing like Nagash and his immortals. Her perception of all around her was greatly enhanced, and her senses were particularly attuned to the scent, taste, and rhythms of the living. Her weakness was blood. She had a near-endless thirst which was never fully sated. Blood was the source of her power, and she needed to drink each and every night to sustain her newfound strength and vitality. Neferata had shared her gift with some of the members of the Cabal, ingesting tiny vials of her blood allowing them a portion of her power. She even offered the same with the promise of everlasting life to Prince Zion of Cathay when he demanded the exorbitant final payment for the supply of the dragon staves that had defeated Nagash over a hundred years previously. The plot the Eastern Kingdom had hatched to force Lamia into becoming a vassal of the Dragon Empire, unraveling in the face of Neferata's exertion of her will over him. 
At a decadent feast, Queen Neferata offered vast sums of gold towards the rebuilding of both Kemri and Merak, but any celebrations from the other priest kings were short-lived, as Queen Kalida of Lybrus, cousin and former ward of the Queen of Lamia, denounced Neferata as a practitioner of necromancy, her unnatural beauty and long life a product of following the teachings of Nagash. Neferata refuted the accusations made against her, but Kalida was a warrior queen and challenged her to prove her innocence in combat. Kalida was more skilled by far, but Neferata was much stronger than she could have imagined, and in the end it was Kalida that fell when the Lamian queen buried her dagger deep in her side. Kneeling by her cousin as her life ebbed away, Neferata whispered the offer of everlasting life, biting her own lip to deliver a blood kiss to Kalida that would heal her mortal wound. The Queen of Libras refused, with the last of her strength, but Neferata delivered the blood kiss regardless. While Nagash began establishing his new empire, and Neferata's power grew in Nehekara, back in the Old World, the aftermath of the War of the Beard was far-reaching for both the High Elves and the Dwarves. Defeated at Tora in 1599 before Sigmar, the High Elves, now under the leadership of newly crowned Phoenix King Caradriel, were forced to put aside the dishonour of losing the Phoenix Crown to the Dwarves, as Malekith enacted his long-held plan to invade Ulthwan once more. Using dark sorcery to hide his fleets, Malekith seized the Blighted Isle and reclaimed much of Nagarith. Several Black Arks were beached to form a new fortress at the harbour of Anlek. Malekith was concerned that with the death of the rash Kalidor II, a less impetuous Phoenix King could be crowned, so the Witch King's forces drove south quickly, besieging the Griffin Gate while the incantations of his sorcerers lured the twisted beasts of the mountains from their lairs to predate on the settlements of the Azur. With Prince Caradriel of Ivresse swiftly elected by the Council of the Princes, his first decree being to abandon the colonies in the Old World and bring those forces back to reinforce Ulthuan, the Phoenix King instituted a system of rotating the troops garrisoned at the fortresses across the Anuli Mountains, giving the Azur the edge over the fatigued invaders. Caradriel was no soldier, but the War of the Beard had given rise to many great commanders in the Azur armies, and the Phoenix King wisely delegated command of his forces to them. Of these, Prince Tethlis of Kalidor was the most gifted, and under his command the siege of Griffin Gate was broken. In the centuries to come, the High Elves and their dark kin would engage in attack and counter-attack, the Phoenix King's armies unable to drive the Dark Elves from their fortress at Anlek, and in turn Malekith's followers were thwarted each time they attempted to sally forth from the Shadowlands, a bitter stalemate that would continue for the entirety of Caradriel's sixth century reign as Phoenix King. Not all the elven colonies of the Old World complied with Caradriel's decree to return to Ulthuan. While most of the fledgling towns and cities were abandoned, the elves living in the shadow of Athol Lauren, the strange and apparently sentient forest that spread from the foothills of the Grey Mountains, felt little attachment to their ancestral homeland. They declared themselves independent of the Phoenix Throne, and took the name Azrai for themselves, and they would become more commonly known as Wood Elves. Despite avoiding much of the conflict during the War of the Beard, once the High Elves abandoned their other colonies, the Dwarves turned their attention to the Azurai settlements, determined to drive all Elves from the Old World. The Dawi marched from their mountain holds and descended on the forest of Athol Lauren, felling trees and setting fires. This desecration of the sentient forest awoke its guardian spirits. Mighty treemen and savage dryads attacked the dwarf armies, but with winter fast approaching, Athol Lauren was at its most vulnerable, and the dwarves were soon victorious. The sentient forest drew back from the Dowie and opened up paths that led them to the settlements of the Azurai, whose presence on Athol Lauren's outskirts had been tolerated at best. No longer able to hide, the Wood Elves were forced to intervene and attack the invading dwarves. The Azurai were much more adept at fighting in the forests than their slow and cumbersome opponents, 
Through hit-and-run ambushes and rapid outflanking through the trees, the dwarves suffered heavy losses while inflicting minimal casualties on the wood elves, and eventually even the stubborn dwarves were forced to retreat from the forest. Following his victory, the Azurai, fearing reprisals from the dwarves, began to dwell deeper in the forest, and they formed separate kindreds as they spread out. Not only did the forest now not seem to resist them, but Athel Lauren chose to open up many of its secrets to the elves. At the very heart of Athel Lauren, a kinbad of Magi discovered the Oak of Ages, and one of their number, Ariel, was able to commune with the forest for the first time. Ariel learned that the forest was slowly recognising the Azrai as a beneficial force, particularly in protecting Athel Lauren in the winter months, when most of the forest spirits were dormant. The elves had always had respect for the natural world, but with Athel Lauren itself embracing their presence, they ensured they treated it in return with the reverence it demanded. While it would still take many centuries before the Azrai kindreds and their woodland home would be truly united, the path was set. While the elven people fractured once more with the separation of the Azrai, under the ruins of the once great city of Tylos, an entirely new race was being born. Nearly two centuries had passed since the human and dwarf occupants of that cursed city had been devoured by swarms of vermin, and in the aftermath the rats grew stronger, seeking further warp stone in the ruins as the weak amongst them were viciously culled. By 1600 before the coming of Sigmar, the first of the true Skaven race began to emerge from the Warrens beneath what would now be known as Skaven Blight. With keen intelligence and humanoid bodies, the Skaven were the absolute masters of their city, and over the centuries to come they would learn to use the corrupting warp stone to harness the ways of magic. But this greater demand for warp stone depleted the supply to be found in the ruins of Tylos, and soon the Skaven were venturing further and further from Skaven Blight to find the precious substance. These scouting parties found a surface world populated by savage and hostile tribes of orcs, goblins and primitive humans, and the Skaven withdrew to plot how they could conquer and dominate these foes. The Skaven multiplied rapidly beneath Skaven Blight, and despite the plagues and scarcity of food, the tunnels soon became massively overpopulated their excavation teams unable to expand the burrow networks fast enough, and they turned to their nascent sorcerers for a solution. The sorcerer's scheme was as ingenious as it was hazardous. Using warp stone, they constructed a huge machine that would channel the light magic that coursed through the earth itself to open a great underground rift. Here, the Skaven would dwell in safety and prosper. The light magic would feed into the arcane device and magnify a spell of the seers that would split open the bedrock however they desired. For decades they laboured until around 1500 before the coming of Sigmar the Skaven seers activated their diabolical device. The ritual progressed well and the incantations of the seers appeared to be starting to work as a great rift started to inch open in front of the machine. But just as the sorcerers began to squeak in delight at their success, some part of their ingenious device failed catastrophically. With a blinding flash, a tidal wave of magical energy ripped through the great chamber and was unleashed upon the world. It swirled into the bedrock of the Black Mountain where it gathered a new strength before expanding outwards further. Skaven Blight was devastated, tunnels collapsed causing countless deaths as the earth heaved and convulsed. The shockwaves caused the undermined land around the city to sink, and seawater rushed in, drowning the tortured plain and turning it into the blighted marshes. Skaven Blight was in ruins, but the Temple of the Horned Rat with its great bell still towered over what remained, and the Skaven that dug their way out from the collapsed tunnels gathered around it seeking the guidance of their malevolent deity. As they squabbled in fear before the towering edifice, the great doors creaked open and twelve grey-clad figures emerged. The Rat Lord spoke with one voice, proclaiming the time had come for the Skaven to spread across the world, to multiply in the dark places and gather their strength for the time of anarchy. Only when the civilizations of order were thrown down could the Horned Rat rejoin his children. He had whispered his plan to them, his Lords of Decay, who would form the first Council of Thirteen and lead the Skaven race. 
The calamity had worsened their situation, but when evacuating the tunnels below Skaven Blight, the Ratmen discovered the partial success of their scheme. The machine had opened great cracks that led to miles of dank, lightless caverns in the roots of the world. The Lords of Decay decreed that the Skaven would be divided into twelve parts, each led by one of their number. Some would remain in Skaven Blight, while the others would spread out from the depths of the city, ensuring no single great disaster could ever threaten their entire race again. This would be the Great Migration, or as the Skaven called it, the Great Sniff. It would not be long until the expansion of the underground Skaven Empire would lead them into direct conflict with the victors of the War of Vengeance, the Dwarves. Despite emerging victorious in the War of the Beard and claiming dominion over the Old World, the Karazhan Corps had been greatly weakened by the centuries of warfare with the Elves. The Dwarf Throngs returned to their holds, but it wasn't long before the first of a series of disasters struck. In far off Lustria in the year 1500 before Sigmar, the Slan Lord Quex enacted a great ritual to realign the continents in a way he felt was intended by the Old Ones. Unfortunately, the result of this magical shifting of the tectonic plates was devastating for the Karazhan Corps, as terrible earthquakes occurred along the entire length of the World's Edge mountains. Before the dwarfs could attempt to start rebuilding their realm, the Skaven enacted their disastrous experiment. The effects of these events combined became known as the Great Cataclysm. While the damage to Skaven Blight had been significant, as the energy emanated outward from the Skaven city, it became even more devastating. The coursing energies unleashed triggered earthquakes and volcanic eruptions all along the World's Edge mountains that rocked the Ever Peak itself. Long extinct volcanoes were violently rekindled, and massive snow capped peaks trembled as the dwarf kingdom was smashed asunder. Earthquakes, landslides, and lava flows devastated the ancient realm and swept away whole cities overnight. The walls of the greatest strongholds were broken. Subterranean highways known as the Ungrim Angkor collapsed and mine workings were shattered as the whole of the everlasting realm was thrown into disarray. Although they had defeated the Azur, the dwarves still faced many other threats in the Old World. With the Karaz Angkor severely weakened and the holds isolated by the damage to the Underway, making it impassable, their ancient enemies struck. Tribes of orcs and goblins besieged the embattled dwarf hold in what would become known as the Goblin Wars, as the dwarfs entered their time of woes. Karak Ungor was the first to fall, its defences split by great fissures that allowed vast numbers of night goblins from the Red Eye tribe to rampage into the stronghold. King Morek's stone hammer and his army were still in the west when the hold fell, but despite many efforts to reclaim their ancestral home, they were eventually forced to retreat, leaving the night goblins in control of the fortress that would become known as Red Eye Mountain. In 1499 before Sigmar, the dwarfs at Karak Van were already hard-pressed fighting off hordes of orcs and goblins, when a new threat erupted from below. Tunneling Skaven broke through into the partly flooded lower workings of the hold, and within a few years they had seized most of the lower levels, and were fighting the Greenskins for possession of the halls above. Within a further year, the mines at Ekrand on the western border of the Badlands would fall to a marauding orc migration led by warlord Argor Fospike. The dwarves forced to abandon their holdings in the Dragonback Mountains or face annihilation, and Ekrand would be renamed Mount Bloodhorn by its new occupants. Over the next century and a half, the gold mines at Gunbad, that were also the only source of the highly prized Brightstone, would fall to Night Goblins of the Bloody Spear tribe, and the twenty year long Silver Road Wars would be lost, as Mount Silverspear was captured by war boss Uruk Grimfang, and the ruined hold renamed Mount Grimfang in honour of its new overlord. The whole of the eastern fringe of the World's Edge Mountains was subsequently abandoned. All over the Old World, the smaller settlements and mines of the Dwarves were destroyed and occupied by their enemies, dividing and isolating their remaining strongholds and fracturing the everlasting realm forever. 
While the dwarf realms were besieged on all sides, the great migration of the Skaven continued apace. Within a hundred years of disaster in Skaven Blight, the clans had spread along the World's Edge Mountains to the Southlands, Araby, and the Darklands. By 1450 before the coming of Sigmar, the Lord of Decay, Malkrit, had led what was now known as Clan Molder into Troll Country north of Kislev, where they established a stronghold that would become known as Hell Pit. Here, warpstone dust was carried from the north, causing rapid mutations in the beasts that prowled the wastes, and soon Clan Mulder were creating twisted monsters to augment their strength. Meanwhile, the expedition in the Darklands were migrating across the Mountains of Morn, when their Lord of Decay, Vistrin, was mortally wounded by a dragon. Before succumbing to his injuries, Lord Vistrin instructed his successor to continue far to the east and establish their colony in Cathay. What would become known as Clan Eshen would pass from the knowledge of the other clans. They were not the only clan to lose contact with the Lords of Skaven Blight during the early days of the Great Migration. The clan that reached the deserts of Arabe found tunnels beneath the great ocean and made their way the countless miles under the huge body of water to Lustria. By 1399, at the start of what the Lizardmen would call the Age of Strife, the Skaven expedition would arrive in the steaming jungles and insect-filled swamps of that green hell. They would be ravaged by virulent tropical diseases, and soon they numbered only a few hundred. But those who survived were inured to the deadly pestilences, and embraced their afflictions as signs of the Horned Rat's blessing. Unbeknownst to the Slan, the Ratmen established a colony in the ruins of the temple city of Quetzal, and unearthed dark secrets from its catacombs beneath. With each generation, they became stronger, fighting the Lizardmen in the surrounding jungles and enslaving and sacrificing thousands of them in dark, twisted rituals to the Horned Rat. Eventually, they would become known as Clan Pestilence, and their most zealous and devoted members, the plague monks of that corrupted clan. We return now to the shores of the Sour Sea in the Old World, and by 1350 before the coming of Sigmar, Nagash had subjugated all the Forsaken tribesmen, casting down each of their hill forts in the north of the Plain of Bones. His legion of undead servants had grown so large that even Nagash could not keep them all under control at the same time. The southern Yaghur barbarians were now transformed from centuries of cannibalism into more beast than man, misshapen monsters with clawed hands propelling their hairless, hunched bodies forwards on all fours like bloodthirsty apes. They were the first of the ghouls. Over the two and a half centuries Nagash pursued his campaign against the Forsaken, the Plain of Bones had been transformed. The soil churned by pick and shovel to dig up the remains of fallen warriors from centuries past, to add to Nagash's hoard, and the northern approach was now fortified with a stone-walled gatehouse and imposing citadels at each end. A pall of stinking ashen cloud hung low over the plain, plunging it into perpetual darkness. Brooding over the southern end of the plain stood the dark mountain now called Nagashazar. A quarter millennium of constant labor had turned the mountain into a fortress, high walls girdling the wide slopes and hundreds of towers interspersed between barracks, storehouses, foundries, and mine workings. The Great Barrow Plain was now covered in vast piles of toxic slag, and the marshland to the north where the Yaghur still dwelled was now a poisonous swamp devoid of all life bar the ghoulish flesh eaters. Despite the scope of the surface fortifications, it represented only a fraction of the enormous stronghold, as Nagash's undead servants had excavated miles upon miles of tunnels, mine shafts, and vaults in the depths of the mountain itself. Unbeknownst to Nagash, however, Skaven had also tunneled into the darkest depths of his fortress, and in time they would make their presence known. 
These first Skaven scouts reported the presence of Nagash's mine shafts and tunnels to exploit the warp stone contained in Nagashazar's depths, and brought word back to their grey seers in Skaven blight under whose orders the Dark Mountain was being explored. Despite the Shears' efforts to keep this discovery secret, the ruling Council of Thirteen soon became aware of the potential riches held in the depths of the mountain, and it was not long before their expeditionary forces were competing violently for the opportunity to claim this great prize, all while Nagash remained unaware of their attentions. Eventually the Seer Lord, leader of the Grey Seers and a member of the Council himself, persuaded the other Skaven Lords that the Warpstone riches could only be wrestled from Nagash's clutches if they combined their efforts and shared the spoils of victory over the Great Necromancer. Although none of the council members had any true intention of sharing such a huge prize, they pragmatically agreed, for the moment at least, to work together and soon a combined expeditionary force of all the clans. 50,000 clan rats and even more expendable Skaven slaves, under the command of Warlord Ikrit, would make its way through the tunnels from Skaven Bight to the depths of Nagash's mighty fortress. The largest army their race had assembled in their history would soon attempt to claim the riches of the mountain for the children of the Horned Rat. Queen Neferata still ruled in Lamia, establishing cults and rituals that would provide her and those that had joined her in everlasting life the blood they required for sustenance. Each had been transformed over the centuries in different ways, some becoming more regal, others like Washoran, more monstrous. Lamia was the centre of Nekakaran civilization now, its wealth the rival of all the other great cities combined, and the yearly tribute demanded for their debts to her city, ensuring this state of affairs would continue. The former king's champion Aberash would be the last of the Cabal to accept the poison chalice. Having witnessed the voluntary transformation of the other members of the Cabal, he had steadfastly refused to go beyond imbibing the elixir he had taken for centuries. Finally, Neferata resorted to tricking the champion into taking the poison chalice, and he reacted with fury upon his awakening as an immortal. Aberash resisted the urge to drink blood for many nights, until eventually his mighty will had been overcome, and he had drained a number of citizens in a rampage of bloodletting, before fleeing the city disgusted with what he had become. But Neferata was not content to simply rule Nehekara in secret, and her lust for greater power led her to scheme to gain more direct influence over the former Blessed Land and its priest kings. The reconstruction of Kemri was nearing completion, and the people of the living city now clamoured for a king to be crowned. Seizing this opportunity, Neferata was able to persuade the pregnant Queen of Raistra, whose line would provide Kemri with its new monarch, to drink an elixir laced with her blood, in the belief it was the only way she would deliver her child safely. The priest kings of the other cities were also persuaded by various means to send their royal heirs to Lamia, as Neferata extended her influence into each royal household. The son born to the Queen of Raistra would be given the name al Kadizar, and he would grow strong and healthy as he approached manhood. The Raistrans would soon request his return to them, so he could take his place on the throne at Kemri, but Neferata was unwilling to acquiesce to their demands, and this caused some concern amongst her cabal. The Queen of Lamia had forbidden the use of the knowledge contained in the Books of Nagash to explore the necromantic arts of raising the dead the danger of revolt and retribution from the other priest kings, posed by openly following the great necromancer's teachings still too great. But she had allowed Washoran to begin rituals in secret to converse with the spirits of the dead, in order to increase their knowledge. What she didn't know was Washoran was now attempting to contact one spirit in particular, that of one they assumed was long dead, the spirit of Nagash himself. I hope you've enjoyed our time together, and I've earned your subscription today, and I'll see you again in the near future, where there is only war.